Good morning, everyone. I hope the conference is going well. I hope you found some sessions where you've learned a lot. Also, you've gotten out of your comfort zone. My guess is you're going to get out of your comfort zone in this talk. And you'll be out of your comfort zone in my talk around 4.30. Now, I am delighted and honored this morning to introduce our speaker for the Wallace Foundation Distinguished Lecture, one of AERA's most important addresses. Marta Tienda is the Maurice P. During 22 Professor in Demographic Studies at Princeton University. I have followed her work and learned from it for a generation. It is thoughtful, impeccably researched, and provocative. I should also mention that Marta is the daughter of Mexican migrant laborers. She worked two summers picking tomatoes when money was scarce. She knows firsthand what it takes to overcome the obstacles to higher education so that, that so many low-income students face. And that means something to me. Today, her research and teaching focus on understanding issues of education and poverty, so how more fitting to have someone speak at this conference. Dr. Tienda has been on the boards of the Jacobs Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. She earned a BA from Michigan State University and an MA and PhD from UT Austin. As I will discuss this afternoon, I see life stories as life stories. But Marta sees life stories in numbers. While our work is radically different in method, style, and format, one of the delights of the academic life is to find work such as hers from which I continue to learn a tremendous amount. I should say the format for this is Marta will speak for about half an hour, 40 minutes, and then we'll entertain questions. And uh, there are plenty of seats, so come on up if you're shy. Now, I am doubly thankful that she has agreed to speak to us today. First, she is literally just off the plane from Switzerland where she was doing work. It would have been very easy to just say no to my invitation, but she graciously agreed to speak. And second, to be entirely honest, I can think of no one more appropriate to speak at a conference with the theme of education and poverty than Professor Marta Tienda. Thank you for your gracious introduction. I uh, want to confess that the invitation has forced me to think differently about the, some of these questions of diversity, um, not st starting from my demographic lens, but definitely not staying there. I, it's been at moments, actually, a painful journey, and I've commented to a couple of people, maybe I, uh, I hope I still have a job when I'm done uh, today at my institution. Uh, so the title of my lecture is motivated by reflections over a 36-year career in higher education and insights from research about equity and access to higher education over the past dozen or so years. My higher education research has focused on questions of access, not only who attends and why, but also more difficult questions about who should go and doesn't. The barriers to, to accessing higher education are well documented. The leaky pipeline, the highly unequal K-12 feeder system, the lack, of uh, the lack of information about college costs, spotty counseling, weak college going cultures at under-resourced schools, soaring college costs, the list goes on and on and replays like refrains in popular songs. Even as the barriers to higher education persist, there appears to be good progress on one dimension, namely the racial diversification of college campuses. This is not an accident, but partly the result of several hard fought battles at the ballot box and in the courts, and partly the tailwinds of racial landscape of the nation. That universities value racial diversity is evident both in their use of race-sensitive admissions as a strategy to broaden access for underrepresented groups and the enormous legal costs sustained in defending a practice that is yet again on trial. So today I want to question 
not if, but what, how institutions of higher education value diversity by asking whether its pedagogic benefits are being realized. I engage this question by focusing on inclusion, which I define as organizational strategies and practices that promote meaningful social and academic interactions among persons and group who differ in their experiences, in their views, and in their traits. My reason for pursuing this question are twofold. First, to question whether the motives for ca campus diversification are aligned with pedagogic goals. And second, to question wh what strategies institutions of higher education can pursue to capitalize on diversity as a means to promote integration. There's mounting evidence showing how diversity promotes innovation, problem solving, and new ways of thinking in firms. But I submit there's less concrete evidence showing how diversity fosters integration on campus, despite many claims uh, that it does so, and that's why we should pursue it. So to begin, I provide a brief overview of population diversification to illustrate the contours, and especially to show the pace of change, both of which have implications for the prospects of maximizing inclusion on campuses. I then discuss the benefits of diverse campuses and outline the challenges to achieving meaningful integration as campuses become more racially diverse by focusing on ethnic programming and students' social interaction patterns. In closing, I question whether institutions of higher education are leveraging their diverse student bodies in ways that promote inclusion and suggest an agenda for institutional leaders to capitalize on diversity. But first, a note on terminology. Over time, I've noticed a change in the terms used to discuss racial inequalities in ways that seem to blur the extant divisions within and between social groups. Diversity is a sufficiently neutral term to accommodate myriad dimensions, the cultural, the political, economic, and of course, race. But perhaps it is too neutral. To be frank, I find the term inclusive student rather uh, disingenuous, and of course, we all are different. Increasingly, the term diversity is paired with the term inclusion as if both terms imply each other. According to Lehman, the word diversity is somewhat one-dimensional, connoting mainly racial diversity, racial heterogeneity. At least today, the word integration does a better job capturing the special importance to our country of undoing the damaging legacy of laws and norms that artificially separated citizens from one another on the basis of race. So I use the term integration and inclusion interchangeably. Reflecting on the challenges of devising categories to portray the nation's unprecedented diversification at the end of the 20th century, then Census Bureau Director Kenneth Pruitt wrote, quote, not in recorded history has there been a nation so demographically complex. And so it falls on to us, the American citizens of the 21st century, to fashion from this diversity history's first world nation. The diversification narrative he described has continued unabated into the 21st century. In fact, the racial diversification of the US population largely occurred during the last quarter of the 20th century. Between 1950 and 19, uh, 1900 and 1950, the racial makeup of the nation was stable, largely defined in black and white. And before 1970, the Hispanic population was not differentiated from whites, since, but since that time, Hispanics has, have been defined as an ethnic group that can be of any race. The US racial diversification narrative gained momentum after 1960, spurred by the resurgence of mass migration from new sending regions and high fertility among immigrants from Latin America. I don't want to dwell on the racial composition of the US population, but I do want to illustrate two master trends post-1970 that have implications for the challenges and opportunities to integrate college campuses, namely the contours, but especially the pace of racial diversifications for reasons that I'll uh, highlight below. So as an anchor for the uh, next set of slides, which I display quickly for effect, note the shrinking share of the white population from 80% in 1980 to 76% in 1990 to 71% in 2000 and to 62% in the most recent census. Today, less than two thirds of US residents self-identify as non-Hispanic white. So after decades of relative stability, the US racial landscape changed quickly 
In the span of just 40 years, the non-white population share rose from less than 18 to 38 percent. And the numbers involved are formidable because the U.S. population grew 51 percent over the period, rising from 203 million in 1970 to 308 million in 2010. Of course, these aggregate trends belie further heterogeneity by birthplace, nationality, religion, language, et cetera. But for simplicity, the broad racial categories serve to illustrate my point about the race, about the pace of change, which again, I will argue, has Im uh, implications for the emergence and especially the persistence of group boundaries. These trends are not reversible. So the question is whether diversity will undermine social unity. Pruitt put the question more philosophically, how can we live together justly? If diversity and discrimination have been joined together in American history, asked Pruitt, will the pairing grow weaker or stronger as we grow more diverse? Restated for higher education, are diverse universities stronger as they are alleged to be, or are their student bodies pulling apart in invisible and yet profound ways? The answer to whether population diversification will strengthen or weaken the nation and universities also depends on concurrent social trends. It's particularly noteworthy that post-1970 diversification narrative unfolded against the backdrop of rising economic inequality and stagnant social mobility. These social trends also shape how societies and universities adapt to their multicultural future and importantly, whether diversity will promote or undermine inclusion. In a recent op-ed piece, Nobel laureate uh, Joseph uh, Stiglitz declared unequal opportunity our national myth because upward mobility has become an, a statistical oddity. Social mobility was remarkable sta remarkably stable during the period of rapid population diversification. This slide shows that the adult income distribution of children born to parents in the upper and the lower quartiles of the income distribution were largely unchanged since the 1970s, which contrasts with the broadly shared prosperity that most characterized most of the 1950s and 1960s. The mobility stickiness at the lower end of the income distribution is especially problematic for higher education as the costs of college rise faster than incomes. This slide reveals that most of the intergenerational mobility and in income occurs to children whose parents fall in the middle of the income distribution. Approximately one-fifth of offspring from parents in the middle income categories ended up in each of the quintiles as adults. This would be good news, except that the middle class has shrunk since 1970, just when the population diversification narrative gained momentum. My colleague Alan Kruger, current chairman of the Council Council of Economic Advisors estimated that the middle class, defined as a share of households with annual incomes within one half of the national median, fell eight percentage points as the income distribution became more unequal. The recession widened the wealth gap even further, but make no mistake, our nation's pulling apart has been underway for several decades. So to summarize, I shall indulge with a quote. Recent social indicators suggests that the United States has drifted from commitments to equal opportunity professed during the 1960s. Racial and ethnic inequality has been rising, support for affirmative action has been eroding, and anti-immigrant sentiment has been intensifying. Although not unprecedented, the most recent upsurge in immigrant bashing is problematic for social cohesion because future economic opportunities will favor those from advantaged backgrounds even more than in the past. New York Times today has a great uh, op-ed by Sean Reardon that makes this point very uh, poignantly. These lines are not from Kruger. Rather, they're from an essay I wrote in 1997, and it is dismaying that it carries as much, if not more, resonance in 2013 as it did when initially penned. The essay was published in a volume about diversity and social cohesion. Notwithstanding the continued opposition to affirmative action in college admissions, the persisting association between family background and social mobility and large disparities in college access by income levels, the national diversification narrative has been felt throughout the educational system and including higher education. Partly due to the tailwinds of the national trends, the undergraduate student population has become more racially heterogeneous since 1970. In 1980, blacks, Hispanics, Native Americans, and Asians combined represented 17% of all undergraduates, but by 2010, their combined share more than doubled to 38%, 
which is quite similar to the national population share. What's more, this increased diversification of undergraduate enrollment incurred even as the size of the population of students rose 72 percent, which is even more than that increase for the national population. However, completion rates represent a less optimistic picture. Among students who enrolled in college in 2004, for example, four and six year graduation rates are consistently highest for whites and Asian students and lowest for African Americans, Hispanics, and Native Americans. Less than half of students who first matriculated in college in 2004 received their degrees in four years. But 41% of white and nearly half of Asian students did so, compared with a fifth to a quarter of blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans. By 2010, six years after initially enrolling, about two-thirds of Asian and white students had earned a college degree compared with only two in five Africans and Native Americans, and about half of Hispanics. Explanations for the observed differentials abound in the academic literature, but my reasons for illustrating them are not to ask whether are to ask whether institutions are committed to retention and completion as they are to diversifying their admissions and enrollment. How is the goal of inclusion served by persisting differentials in completion rates along racial and ethnic lines? Paralleling these trends in baccalaureate degree enrollment, the composition of students seeking advanced degrees also became more racially heterogeneous, albeit less so than undergraduate student population. The data show impressive increases in black and Hispanic enrollment in graduate programs, especially after 1990, even as the number of degree holders, um, degree seekers, surged 73% between 1980 and 2010. Serving as Director of Graduate Studies and Population has brought into sharp relief the challenges graduate schools face in broadening the pool of applicants for advanced degrees. There have, I've recently begun uh, focusing on the transition from baccalaureate to the graduate programs and was quite surprised to learn that conditional on graduating from college, blacks and Hispanics are significantly more likely to, than whites to enroll in graduate school and that they do so at a faster rate. This figure, which graphs the cumulative percent of a college graduation cohort ever enrolled in graduate school by race, reveals that the enrollment advantage of non-white students relative to whites persists over the 10-year over the ten -year period after college graduation. Hispanics and Asians enrolled the earliest, followed by blacks. Initially, I thought that the graduate school enrollment advantage of blacks and Hispanics reflected positive selection. However, additional analyses disconfirmed this hunch because they average lower grades and GRE scores than whites. I point this out not to question whether the admitted students are capable of succeeding in graduate school, they are, I was, but rather to ask whether aggressive recruitment of minority students is matched by retention strategies to ensure the completion rates. Unfortunately, and despite their ostensibly higher probability of enrolling in a post-baccalaureate degree program, blacks and Hispanics have lower odds of completing their sought degrees. Among BA recipients who enrolled in a graduate program, approximately two-thirds of whites and Asians received a degree, compared with only 55 and 57 percent of African American and Hispanic students, respectively. So this is where we stand uh, to date with the well-known pipeline clearly in evidence. Circling black to the diversification narrative, I appreciate that aggregate trends in college and graduation sc um, graduate school enrollment do not address enormous variation in racial diversity among selective and open admission campuses, nor do I believe or claim that proportionality should be used as a measure of social justice. My point is merely to show that higher education has participated in the changing demographic landscape and that the pace of diversification in higher education enrollment was equally rapid, but that the completion rates continue to lag far behind. That is why, in keeping with my concerns about equity and integration, I underscore that blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans re remain woefully underrepresented among degree res uh, recipients. So despite our heritage as a liberal democracy, as a nation, we have struggled with conceptions of inclusion and fairness in many social domains, including, and perhaps especially education, which is the key stepping stone to social mobility, as I know all too well. History shows that merely outlawing discrimination neither equalized educational opportunities nor created the just society to which Pruitt alluded. 
Before the landmark Brown decision, legal scholars questioned whether integration was necessary for equality of opportunity. It's since that time, the legal and political controversy has focused on the acceptable means for integration and whether the educational benefits of ethno-racial heterogeneity used to justify the racial preferences as a means to diversify college campuses remains a highly contest a contested issue about which others and I have written extensively. Many more will surely write about the, following the highly anticipated uh, Fisher decision. My concern today is about whether campus diversification has been accompanied by integration, and in particular opportunities for the robust exchange of ideas, especially different viewpoints required for learning. Since the 2003 Grutter decision, much scholarship has documented the positive benefits of diversity on campus and in the workplace. In his highly influential book, The Difference, Scott Page argues that diversity trumps ability in problem solving when it involves collections of people with non-redundant skills and experiences. This is certainly the philosophy behind the design of interdisciplinary programs positioned to forge new scientific frontiers by bringing together scholars from different theoretical orientations and who use varying analytical approaches. However, heterogeneity is but a necessary ingredient for achieving socially legitimate goal of integration. Its realization is not guaranteed. Rather, because human tendencies to assemble in islands of comfortable consensus, integration must be strategically and deliberately cultivated through interactions that engage the diverse life experiences of students from different racial, geographic, religious, and political backgrounds. Of course, academic leaders and administrators do understand that learning is impoverished when it occurs among homogeneous groups of like-minded people, but are they maximizing the differences for learning and integration? I keep repeating. Indeed, there's mounting evidence showing that students who interact with peers from different ethnic backgrounds develop more positive academic and social concepts, graduate at higher rates, achieve superior leadership skills, have higher levels of civic involvement, and importantly, exhibit lower levels of prejudice after graduation. But diversity is a double-edged sword. I think I'm off a slide, I'm sorry. Uh, diversity is a double-edged sword is emphasized by affirmative action opponents who equate elusive critical mass with the disguised quotas. Much was made during preparations uh, to argue the Grutter case about the need for a critical mass in order to avoid isolation and achieve meaningful diversity. However, how many members of underrepresented groups are needed so that students do not feel socially or intellectually isolated? This question has not been satisfactorily answered either in relative or absolute terms. And unfortunately, it has deflected attention from the ultimate goal of campus diversification, namely integration that is achieved through interaction in multiple domains, through collective problem solving, but especially through the robust exchange of ideas. Now we'll do the odd couple. This photo, which is taken from a lead article in the Princeton Alumni Weekly, is an apt illustration of Washington and Jefferson College President Herring Smith's admonition to engage in visible diversity. To most observers, Robbie George and Cornell West are different in obvious ways. One is black, one is white, one is tall, one is short, one sports a beard, and the other is clean shaven. That is not why the cover page with caricatures was dubbed the odd couple. Rather, they are an intriguing pair because of their orthogonal ideological perspectives. Robert George is a self-described conservative and devout Catholic. Cornell West is a liberal public intellectual. As external proof of their credentials during the semester they co-taught, George visited the Pope and West met Hugo Chavez. The Odd Couple co-taught a freshman seminar in 2007 that not only riveted a handful of lucky students, I remember reading the article to this day, but also fostered their own, what they quote, intellectual awakening as they refined their own ideas through vigorous intellectual exchange in the audience of 15 lucky students. Their disagreements about race and the possibility of achieving a colorblind society re-engaged visible and invisible diversity when West argued that some groups, such as African Americans, feel alienated on Princeton's campus, and George quipped that he thought the alienated groups were the conservatives. 
Admittedly, the odd couple would be super odd if West was a staunch conservative and George was a left-leaning liberal, as proponents of the critical mass argument would claim. Their contrasting ideas when engaged proved more than sufficient. Based on student interviews, there was enormous benefit to witnessing and discussing their distinct approaches to common readings. In short, the pedagogic benefits for students were enormous on this occasion. How this seminar came about is not part of an institutional strategy to engage diverse views, I'm sorry to say. As the president of, of Washington and Jefferson College does, as a matter of priority and policy. Rather, it was a fortuitous result of an interview between the two men that was arranged by a student that both men had taught. Serendipity can and often does lead to innovation, as in this instance, where the entrepreneurial student who knew both professors served as a link. However, it is fair to ask again whether the formidable yet critical challenges of capitalizing on diversity in order to enrich learning environments should be left to chance. Disagreement more than consensus is the source of learning. Non-redundant experiences are more important for solving daunting social problems. Comparison is key for individual experience, for understanding our individual experiences. My own work on the Hispanic population has always been comparative with blacks, whites, and Asians. It is through systematic analysis of similarities and differences that I came to understand what does Hispanicity mean anyway whether it is an enduring or transitory phenomenon, and the likely integration prospects of newcomers. I learned about Hispanics by studying non-Hispanics. Critics of race preferences also claim that race-sensitive admissions geared to achieving group-specific critical masses reproduce racial divisions through self-segregation, which then are reinforced institutionally via ethnic studies programs, ethnic-themed houses, and the proliferation of group-specific cultural events, all of which allegedly undermine cross-group interaction. I emphasize allegedly because the evidence is mixed, as I will explain shortly. Given the banter about critical mass notion during the or oral arguments at the October hearing of the Fisher versus Texas case, both criticisms need to be addressed. Before doing so, it's appropriate to consider why intragroup sorting occurs under conditions of rapid diversification as witnessed in the United States and in higher education specifically. Invoking insights from cognitive dissonance and evolutionary psychology, Chris and Melidi explain that both the pace and scope of social differentiation trigger resistance to integration, partly because the evolutionary timescale of human cognition capacities has not kept pace with the globalization of group experiences. This chart, which summarizes their theories, builds on several key insights from cognitive and evolutionary psychology, that humans have an evolved propensity to think categorically about groups, that humans have an evolved preference for homogeneity and stability, and that cognitive apparatus involves two systems that are activated to distinguish friends from foes and to build coalitions. And that there is a tipping point that engages the cognitive system conducive to integration. The tipping point may be a critical mass, but not necessarily, as South Africa's long apartheid system shows. The coalition detecting system, detection system is protective and reinforces group boundaries. The coalition building system is triggered when preconceptions of others are challenged. In homogeneous local systems, this two-tiered cognitive system serve populations well to distinguish the friends from the bow, the in-group from the out-group. But it is poorly aligned to the realities of multicultural societies and universities like those that we work in. Social integration in multicultural environments requires activation of the coalition building system to resolve the dissonance that arises from positive cross-group encounters. In other words, quote, social diversity results in cooperative and tolerant behavior only when it requires one to think beyond ancestral building blocks of modern society. Put differently, to foster integration, it's necessary to engage members of different groups in activities that challenge their stereotypes about the other, however defined, Muslim and Christian, black and brown, male and female. Chris Bemelidi's argument has several implications for inclusion in, in higher education. To foster integration under conditions of rapid diversification, higher in education institutions require active strategies to inhibit those natural tendencies for students 
to fall back on their coalition detection systems by sorting into homogeneous social niches. If diversification of college campus is merely a pragmatic first step toward realizing these pedagogic benefits of heterogeneous learning environments and fostering the broader social goals of integration, it's fair to ask whether and what institutions are doing to achieve inclusion. Given how the dual cognitive system operates, it's clear that neither educational benefits of diversity nor the broader mission of inclusion will occur even when critical masses are achieved, however one defines them. Moreover, integration may actually be hampered by students' proclivity to sort in racially homogeneous groups and enroll in ethnic studies courses. Studies of segregation mostly measure cross-group integration using an index of exposure, which reflects the likely contact between groups based on the experience of a typical person. But of course, none of us are typical. Such measures are not particularly helpful on college campuses, measures that we demographers love, uh, where contexts of interaction range from team sports to classrooms to dorms. My co colleague S Thomas Espenshade and his collaborator Alexandria Radford conducted a comprehensive study of campus life at several post-secondary institutions that represent the size and selectivity of universities nationally. Importantly, their survey asked about interactions with classmates of different races across several domains and also whether they participated in ethnic studies courses. I cannot pretend to do justice to their highly nuanced coverage of this subject, but let me highlight key findings that are relevant for my concerns about meaningful integration and that have been the focus of the affirmative action critic. Espen Shade and Radford conclude that general socializing represented in the first two bars is the most common way that racially distinct groups interact on college campuses, anything from casual um, integration to classroom exposure. These bars represent the percent of classmates who socially socialize frequently or somewhat or mostly frequently with groups, members of the same race or other races. Unquestionably, there is much more interaction within than between racial groups. Yet nearly two thirds of students report that they socialize often or very often with another race groups. It's noteworthy that half of the students res um, live with roommates of another race. This may be assigned as part of the university's mission and half report cross-race friendships. This may be a product. Given the pervasiveness of um, residential and school segregation in the United States, these patterns of cross-racial uh, relations on campus are indeed encouraging. Aida Hurtado has emphasized that the frequency, quality, and context of interaction determines whether cross-group relations shatter pre-existing stereotypes in ways that further the project of integration. Because mo the most prevalent cross-group uh, interaction involves socializing, this tabulation unpacks the underlying behaviors by race. Several points are noteworthy. First, whites tend to keep largely to themselves, with 96% reporting that they often or very often socialize with other whites. Hispanics are most likely to socialize with members of other groups, possibly because of our amb ambivalent status in the US racial scene. Most of us uh, have an easier time passing as white. Asians and blacks are intermediate between these extremes as 81 and 86% respectively report that they often or very often socialize with members of their own race group. Odds ratios based on the relative frequency of contact between group pairs relative to contact with their own group are useful metrics to reveal the implied social distance in the prior table. Cross-racial interactions involving whites occur most frequently with Hispanics and to a lesser extent Asians. However, blacks and Asians are 80% less likely to interact with each other than with members of their own group. Whites are least likely to socialize frequently with African Americans. And what's more, these social distance patterns are very similar to those based on national data about group attitude towards each other. What is not clear is whether these, parents, these patterns result from self-segregation or exclusion. But my question is whether these patterns reflect integration. Yes and no. Yes, because there is evidence of cross-group socializing. No, because the amount of social contact within groups is greater than that between groups. Racial boundaries are clearly evident in socializing behavior, but there appears to be considerable permeability in these boundaries, especially for Hispanics and to a lesser extent Asians. These groups then, Asians and Hispanics, offer promising openings then to foster 
the project of integration on campus. And I do understand that it's convenient to focus on the so-called minorities, URMs as they're called on my campus, underrepresented uh, minorities, uh, and their tendencies to hang together. For large majorities of black and Latino youth, this is the only world that they have known. For as much progress has been made toward integration at the societal level, even today there are communities where an, integration, an integrated prom is a novel idea. Take Wilcox County, Georgia. At the initiative of two white students and two black students, their school this year will sponsor the first integrated prom after several decades of separate proms, according to the New York Times article last week. Since schools were desegregated in 1970s, Wilcox County schools officials turned blind eye to the persisting practice of racially segregated proms because they were private, invitation-only affairs organized by their parents. And in 2004, Toombs County, Georgia also made national news when it was reported that they sponsored three proms, one black, one white, Latino. Again, the principal said he was not at fault. This was the parents doing. These behavioral norms carry over to higher education where the boundaries theoretically can be dismantled, but often are largely reproduced. And so I ask, if integration cannot be a table stake for universities' diversity aspirations, then where? If not now, then when? Are administrators also complicit in the slow pace of campus diversification? And to what extent these patterns reflect uneven distribution of groups across fields of studies is also unclear, but there is additional evidence for segregation in patterns of coursework. Yet again, among students who enroll in courses with ethics content, there is a clear tendency for minority groups to enroll in courses consonant with their own identity, with black students most likely to do so. Furthermore, it's striking that relatively low shares of white students enroll in ethnic studies courses. To the extent that the content of ethnic studies courses is germane for challenging the pre-existing stereotypes, the racial differential in enrollment patterns are troubling. Student clubs further perpetuate the maintenance of group boundaries. On my own campus, there were no less than six Hispanic organizations until the spring when the two largest merged. This is something I had encouraged for many years because the, the existence of multiple Hispanic organizations runs counter to the goal of integration, even within the so-called Latino umbrella. By organizing along national origin lines, the student organizations miss important opportunities to learn how they differ, but even more importantly, that meaningful similarities trump differences that are mostly symbolic. I learned that there are even more Asian student organizations on campus, some differentiating by language within nationalities. The impetus stems partly from the vast availability of funds on my campus for student activities, and partly from the overly flexible criteria for group formation on my campus. So in this instance, the university is a tacit enabler, just like the school board in Wilcox County, Georgia. As the founding director of the Latino Studies program at Princeton, I propose locating the program under the rubric of American Studies rather than Latin American Studies and delayed establishing the program until after the release of the National Academy of Science report about Hispanics and the Amer American future that I chaired. I assumed the intellectual foundations for the program were evident and that the locating the program in American studies would first convey that Latinos are part of the American mosaic, sharing some similarities and many differences with earlier immigrant, immigrant uh, minority groups, and second, to provide a broad comparative umbrella for understanding the U.S. Hispanic social and cultural experience and how it differs from that of African Americans and Asian Americans. I also argued that the program would be a failure if only students pursuing a certificate were themselves Hispanic. And finally, I argued that the, for the program to confer pedagogic benefits, it must engage outgroup members from fields beyond humanities and social sciences. Although still in its infancy, my goal is to prevent the program from becoming an ethnic corner. I lost the battle about American studies, but I'm still fighting. So the memo to be written on my return. The takeaway is not that such programs should be avoided, quite the contrary. 
Ethnic studies programs serve an important pedagogical function, but one that is less impactful for the project of integration if their reach is largely confined to the study of myself, the own group members. Rather, my conclusion from this experience is that institutions have a great and important responsibility to build cross-disciplinary programs in ways that maximize heterogeneous enrollment so that they do not become islands of comfortable consensus. My ideal is for more than 50% enrollment in ethnic studies programs to uh, no more than that to consist of own group members, but I would not object to 60-40. So to conclude, I have argued that, as have many others, that enrollment of underrepresented groups is but the pragmatic first step toward the ultimate goal of inclusion. Presence on campus neither guarantees integration into campus life nor does it lead to the realization of the pedagogic benefits of diversity that the lawyers so clearly articulated before the Supreme Court in 2003 and have done so more recently. This is one of the core arguments used to justify the exception to the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. The mission of higher education is not to align the representation of the citizenry with its student populations, but rather to foster integration in order to reap the pedagogic benefits. Learning is compromised greatly when universities permit the proliferation of havens of homogeneous groups of like-minded people. As a core foundation of good citizenship, racial diversification of higher education institutions is both the pedagogic interest and it is an interest in democratic legitimacy. As such, it is necessary for educational institutions to be visibly integrated, which is the core principle that Sandra Day O'Connor wrote into her statement, her decision. Writing for the majority in the Grutter opinion, uh, Grutter versus Bollinger decision, Justice O'Connor supported that the continued use of narrowly tailored, race-sensitive admissions, admissions is constitutional by arguing that our nation's public institutions should be pursuing the larger national project of integration, a project that is at the core of 21st century America's understanding of itself as democratically legitimate. I've added the emphasis. This argument resonates, resonates with Prince Pruitt's questions about whether and how we can learn to live together justly, and my specific concerns about whether diversification of college campuses will reproduce existing social and class divisions or foster new forms of social cohesion. I conclude that the jury is out on both counts. Given that the means to achieve racial diversity remain controversial, it would serve the common good if higher education leaders led the charge to demonstrate how inclusive learning environments serve national interests. Lessons from the private sector that link a broad array of metrics to the financial bottom line do not fit with the culture of universities. I get it. Because we claim the, the intellectual output does not lend itself to standardized accounting systems. I get it. But higher education institutions are in the business of evaluation. Students are graded in their work for courses. Faculty are graded in their teaching and their research productivity. And universities regularly and diligently track their applicant, admit, and enrollment pools so that they can withstand legal scrutiny. It is not unreasonable then to ask university administrators whether their verbal commitments to diversity is matched by their success in attracting and retaining students from underrepresented groups and in closing raci uh, racial disparities in completion rates. Given the large economic and social inequities that accompanied the diversification narrative of the nation and the universities, closing the racial graduation gaps is key for democratic legitimacy as envisioned by Justice O'Connor. It's also possible to leverage diversity for pedagogical benefit and for the project of integration by providing incentives for cross-race initiatives, courses, peer-led activities that work against evolved human preferences for homogeneity, stability, simplicity, and structure. More generally, if leaders of higher education institutions genuinely believe that racial diversity enhances their pedagogic mission, then it behooves them to continually develop innovative strategies to maximize learning benefits, to demonstrate what works and what doesn't, and to institutionalize best practices as if their futures depended on achieving inte integration. I shall close by proposing one compelling state interest, 
for making integration a top priority on campuses and throughout higher education and K through 12. The diversification narrative that I've developed actually uh, shows that all of the diversification is largely taking place at the lower ends of the, of the uh, age distribution. And it is here where not to invest in the young people and make them the future leaders of America is going to compromise our national global competitiveness and our ability to actually come together and prepare for our aging population. That young people are among the youngest, are more diverse than the seniors who have already benefited from the productivity and global leadership of our, of our nation. And so I leave you with this thought about the future of America and what's at stake for not inclusion, for promoting an agenda of inclusion and integration. I thank you. I shall, of course, take questions if you want to challenge me. <laughs> yes. Okay, can you hear me now? I'm s okay, there we go. Okay. On your slide for a modest agenda, a modest agenda, uh, how do you propose to fulfill item number two, demonstrate diversity and inclusion serves compelling national interests? I started by giving an example because I felt that that was going to be the, the challenge. So I had to take the lead. If I'm going to say it needs to be done, then I started by looking at by saying, look at the age, uh, it, it, we ignore the diversification of our K through 12 and higher education population at our peril. This was the case that was made in arguing the Grutter decision. It was the amicus briefs of the military that showed and argued that we cannot have a military where all the leaders are white and the followers are non-white, or disproportionately. We cannot lead and expect to be effective on the field if we have that kind of a structure. And the military has demonstrated all that we can be, a very powerful book that took the challenge of integration very seriously and learned and developed strategies to promote from within and to cultivate the future leaders. Colin Powell was a beneficiary of that commitment. General Motors argued the same thing. Microsoft argued the th same thing. And in the meantime, Microsoft and all the IT industries are arguing that we have to look abroad for that leadership. No, we don't. We can cultivate it on our campuses. Every child can learn. End of story. So. I say, demonstrate that they serve compelling national interests. It is in our interest as our population ages to make sure that the social security check of each retiree can be produced by a highly productive non-retiree worker. The current situation is that it takes nine low-wage workers to produce each social security check. Our population that is shrinking, fertility is declining even for Mexicans and for all the new immigrant groups. So our demography will not allow that to happen. We must increase the productivity of our young people. And that's what's going to allow this generational mismatch along racial lines to come together. So we know what we have to do, and that's why I'm pushing the leadership of higher education, not to just walk the walk, to, but to not to talk the talk, but also to walk the walk. Come on. Marcus, thank you for an extraordinary talk. To what extent do you think we need also a more diverse leadership in higher education to advance this agenda? As I look at the K through 12 level, for example, I'm struck by the fact that whereas 20% of our students to date are Latino, only 250 of the 14,000 superintendents in the nation are Latinos, even though there is very good evidence that Latino superintendents are much more likely to implement the kinds of policies you've talked about here. So what are your thoughts for the higher level? 
do we need a more diverse leadership and what will take to produce that i i absolutely do and it's it's heartbreaking to see uh, you know as i was writing this and i thank bill for making me think outside of my own comfort zone i started to feel like i did in the 70s as an ornament when i am asked to show up just to be there look at me we have one of them and it reminded me of my days as an assistant professor at Michigan, at University of Wisconsin in the College of Agriculture, no less, where I was on a committee and I was such a weirdo because I was the only female, I was the only young person, everybody else had gray hair then, I still don't, <laughs> I, and I was the only Hispanic, the only minority, one of them. And so today, that same phenomenon occurs. When I was asked to show up at a recruiting lunch for minority students in the Woodrow Wilson School, I didn't get to talk to anybody. I got to sit there and be there. Well, I'm too old for that now, and I don't like it. I think we have an obligation. That's why I work very hard when I find students that are from the California in the in the valley, and I said, why are you here, or South Texas? How did you even hear of this place? And I tell them, your job is to bring two before, I'm not telling you how long it takes, multiply. We know about compound interest. The demography is on our side. We need to develop those strategies. And the w that's why I focused a little bit on higher education and graduate school enrollment, because that's where we have to focus on the, on the professoriate. I didn't have enough time, I was limited in what, how much I could go into that. I read several articles about the challenge we face. It does matter to young people to see people like themselves. And my experience, my own socialization was, as a geek that I've always been, was just to focus and not pay attention to that in Wisconsin. I didn't have to worry about finding people like me because there weren't very many. I was the oddity. But when I went to Stanford and teaching, and suddenly it was a very different experience. It was like going from Michigan, where I was raised, to Texas. And I saw it was a different scene. It was people like me. And at California and, and, and Stanford, it was the same. And I learned something very important while I was teaching there, visiting in between jobs. And young, I gave a lecture. And afterwards, two graduate students called, came to me, and they said, we feel vindicated. And I did not understand why. And they said, you know, you're just like us. You wear big earrings, you wear high heels, you know, you dress the way you do, and you could answer those white guys just like any one of them. And I said, because I'm a social scientist, I'm not here as a minority in residence. But I learned something powerfully important that day, and it was that it does matter for young people to be able to see themselves. And since that day, I have made it a point to try to reach out to young people because it is my responsibility. I worry that people with my background coming today to the United States with a parent who has, both parents, had less than primary school education will not have the same opportunities that we did because the school systems were different. And in, in the 50s, don't, don't figure my age, in, in the 50s, it was possible it was possible to earn a living wage in the working class. And education was a really important goal for my father and my mother. They never had that, and they wanted, they wanted us to achieve a high school education more than anything, something they knew the consequence of not having. And that's why my father promised my mother on her deathbed that every one of us would graduate from high school. But what he never anticipated that we even stop. And that's the power of education. That's the power of education when campuses are visibly o open, that it can actually promote the mobility. But it's critical that at this stage in 2013 that we do not have, when I showed you the numbers, more diversity in higher education, and I showed you the last slide, I'll show you again, some of us have to retire, get out of the way, so that the young people who are achieving degrees can take our jobs. And I am going to uh, not going to contribute to the blockage that's taking place for the baby boom because the echo that we have pr produced, the echo of the baby boomers that are coming through the system now need their chance. 
and we should not be there blocking those opportunities as sexagenarians and octogenarians. That is not acceptable. To open the pathways to leadership means that some of us who have enjoyed the opportunities of the prosperous 50s and 60s and the social changes that took place during that period need to get out of the way and allow our prodigy to move through the system. And it behooves higher education to make the priority. That's why I kept coming back to show me the money, as Susan or, or Urgent Marsden would say, show me that what you say is actually what you do. And don't tell me you can't find a qualified minority candidate today. That's the rhetoric of the 60s and 70s. And I heard it as I was going on the market. Sorry, that jingle is over. Thank you very much, Dr. Kinda. Um, I just gave the La Raza graduation um, ceremony, the, the speech, uh, welcoming. And one of the, I guess one of the questions that I'm asking, and, and how do you sell the reorganization of some of the ethnic-focused and race-based focused organizations to students? Because I think what you're asking is a radical shift, what sounds like a radical shift, than uh, what has been in place. And I can just hear students on my campus saying, well, wait a minute, we've struggled over these programs. These are the mechanisms that have helped us put social justice uh, initiatives on campus. So if they become islands of comfortable consensus, the study of me, the promotion of me, there is no conversation. It's a monologue with different voices. So. That's why when I pushed the American uh, study, I had a, a meeting with my board, uh, the executive committee just uh, this week, and I was extremely excited that my partner in crime, the director of the American Studies Program, Dirk Hartog, is very interested in, in opening this conversation again. We're gonna have a new president, it's already been announced, um, and we're past the recession, our, our endowment has grown back, so these are all the reasons we heard, you know, the, the um, the endowment was why we couldn't fund better uh, the program. I told him I didn't want to be a stepchild because I'm not interested in being a stepchild. Uh, so what's, uh, what's going to help is it actually is the Asian Studies program. Their alumni have deep pockets and they're pushing. They said, we need Asian Studies entrance and we need Asian Studies entrance. But fortunately, my colleague who's going to be doing this has insisted that it be located under the rubric of American Studies. And this leaves the apertura that we can now then think about having Latino studies under American studies so that the American studies agenda can benefit from the cross-fertilization of both Asian studies and, Ameri and Latino studies. And we, I showed you the demography. Th th this, this is not a reversible trend. Uh, and the question is whether there'll be separate trends. So what I said to the Latino students, they come, they, we have so much money, they all compete and write grants and get money for funding their activities. I said, I don't want to have five of you coming to me and asking me for $500 for this and $500 for that. I want a common thing. You all have a, co why do you have a Latino graduation? That's controversial as well. Uh, you know, I'm going to leave that one alone for now, but, but uh, um, that many universities have one. There's one at Brown. There's, you know, many places. It's because of the need for recognition when you're invisible. But, but um, I say, why not, combine, wh why not combine the organizations? I fed them twice. I organized a dinner. And I said, you guys figure it out, work it out. Um, it depends on, you know, students are kind of fickle. They're kind of funny. But this year, they had the two largest groups merged, Causa Latina and Acción Latina. Causa and Acción Latina. And they were the two most active. This is good. So we can still have a little uh, one with Cubans that may have six or seven members and one on Colombians who has, may, you know, five or six. It doesn't matter. The, the important thing is that the groups can and are coming together in common, in common agendas. M for my taste, it means the rainbow agenda. Again, when I was at Stanford, I had a, a really interesting experience on graduation day when they were celebrating the importance of the, uh, of the, of the free trade agreement of Canada, the United States, and Mexico. And they had the, the secretaries of state of all three places on a very hot day when everybody was wearing their regalia. And uh, th uh, they, they uh, were going through all these things of coming together in the, the hemisphere, yada, yada. 
and the students did something that I will never forget, like that odd couple article that I did. And I, they're both my sons, so I, you know. And so it was that they marched silently during this really important graduation when all the brass was there and the moneyed people with the deep pockets were sitting in the front rows. They, the students had, had black balloons and marched. And these are students that tried to get the attention of the provost. On many occasions, they were just shooed away. And so what they did is they had black balloons, and they just marched silently around the procession, like it would be around this room, and it's the sign saying, end 100 years of racism on campus. Well, guess what happened Monday morning? <laughs> they got invited to a conversation. They didn't, they didn't protest. They didn't burn buildings or, or sit-ins. They just made their voices clear, loudly, through their silence. And it is through that kind of inspired leadership that can bring people to the conversation. It, they're baby steps, but that actually adds up. Baby steps add up when they're against the alternative of doing nothing. And again, just the walk and walk and throwing a few pigeon seeds, a few, just shut up, here, have this, have this, and just shut up. And groups feel, okay, well, at least we exist. No, you don't exist if you can't participate in the conversation. So. Make that case about, sure, you're talking to yourself. Nobody is listening. Nobody is listening. It was that rainbow coalition that got the attention of the administration. And so there are common goals, and once we start talking to each other, we'll find that what unites us is so much more than what divides us. And I'm not saying that we have to eliminate our cultural differences. I, I'm not going to change. That's not going to, I am what I am, but I don't have to give up being Mexican, my Mexican passport, if to, to do what I do, to teach, to, to participate on boards, to lecture, to work with students down on the ground. That's, they're not irreconcilable. They're compatible. And it, that, message is so powerful, some of the most powerful messages, to your point, about having leaders that represent, that look just like us. And so I think that we need to work together. And yes, it's okay to have the groups on campus, but it's not okay to let them become these islands of comfortable consensus. That's a problem, and we need to work on it, all of us. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I, I, uh, I thank you much. I appreciate you focusing on the fact that the correlation between race and income has gotten tighter, not weaker. I mentioned that briefly. I didn't have enough time to engage it because I wanted to focus more on the strategy of inclusion and the institutional leadership questions uh, and, and moving away from this appeasement that we've been engaged in for several years. And I think that's really the formidable challenge. So uh, I looked at uh, Princeton's numbers uh, and I took all this out. I took out big sections. I had to know. I had to do that. But but we admitted, uh, uh, according to what was published in the Alumni Weekly, was 48 percent of our new in, uh, of the admitted students, not the incoming, but the admitted, uh, were of color. Okay, let me go of color. Um, I said I wrote the ad admission. I said, is this correct? And she said, well, here are our numbers. You need to see them for 12 years, go back. And I thought, I don't have time to go through 12 years, but I will do it. Uh, so, so the question is, on a place like Princeton's campus, you get, we, we have no loans policy. So if you get admitted, if, and we do admit a lot of students, you can be very poor. And we'll have the class divisions, are, I think, are quite salient on campus. They don't like to talk about them because they're kind of invisible. But that's why I said engaging invisible diversity. Uh, I think uh, we, there it doesn't matter, but we only admit 
our classes are 1,500. At UT Austin, you're talking, our whole campus is only about 7,000, include all the undergraduates and all the graduates combined. At UT Austin, 10,000 is just the freshman class. So when you're talking about orders of magnitude at private institutions, yes, we can do a lot more, but we are not the, the ones, we're not making the biggest imprint on, on the diverse education narrative. But where we are very impactful is in the leadership, and this is where we have so much possibility. Vartan Gregorian, the former President Brown, suggested, wouldn't it be nice if the leaders of higher education at the Ivies, all right, at the Ivies, got together and said, let's eliminate the SAT. Right, we know <laughs> that it doesn't do anything, but it has created the barriers for access. Wouldn't that be nice? But no, I mentioned it to my one Ivy president, and they go, well, nobody wants to be the first to do that because they may not follow suit, as Princeton learned when they eliminated, and Harvard and Virginia, when they eliminated uh, early access, you know, early admission. And they expected everybody, you know, we're in charge, follow us, follow the lead. Nobody followed. So now they eliminated it because they felt they were eliminating their competitive advantage. So this is the big challenge of the 21st century, and that's why I couldn't focus on diversity and inclusion without also telling you that the sad reality is that we have pulled apart as a society on income. So where's the commitment? Here's where the federal government comes in. And where's the commitment on, on college campuses? There's so much money in this country. Public institutions should make it their goal to engage in fundraising from their alumni to increase access. And it's possible. I've done my own little part. I created a little tiny fellowship program at the University of Texas at Austin in my father's name, not because I think Texas Austin needs my money, they don't, but because I wanted to link this to access for students of South Texas where I'm from, where the poverty rates are incredible to this day, where streets that weren't paved when I was a child many years ago are still unpaved, and where the cultural distance between there, the Rio Grande Valley, and Austin is the same as the cultural distance between there and the moon. Right? I understand that, and so I figured one at a time, students that come, that my only requirement, I don't care what color they are. I don't care if they run upside down on their heads. I do care that they're poor. That's my only consideration, and I do not participate in selecting the students. I let that be the, the done by the schools. It's not my role, I am not. I just want every year one more or two more students to come. And there's, we've done the same thing at the University of Michigan when my brother was killed in a fateful accident um, in a very difficult time. He, the, the Black Student Association at the University of Michigan was really torn. He had, uh, in his first two years of law school, had actually worked to establish an organization to work with uh, migrant farm workers and jailed inmates that were already disproportionately black and Hispanic in Michigan. And so he wanted to take, he worked to work in poverty law and immigration law. That was his goal, which he never got to realize. But it was the Black Student Association who made a donation to the university to establish a fund to honor his legacy. And the university poo-pooed it because it was a flower fund, and they they could, and so they didn't take it. And so the Latino students were even more moved. And what they done, they did is they said, "Well, we're going to have fundraisers." I turned over my last three hundred dollar Ford Foundation scholarship in its entirety to this fund, and th they they raised the two thousand dollar minimum that was needed for the university to accept the gift. Shame on them. But over time, that flower fund has grown to some fairly substantial numbers. Every year today, every year, U of M has the Latino law student, they changed their name twice already, to change with the time, good for them, I'm glad, uh, uh, to be more inclusive, actually. And they, uh, they sponsor the annual Juan Tienda Memorial Scholarship Dinner. And they now give, not just book fund, which is how it was started, they give several internships, grants, they give several fellowships, 
in addition, the number of grants that they're giving are quite substantial. Of course, you know, I contributed over time when I was on boards and my sisters did. And at this, at this annual event that takes place on the, the Black Students, they dance up a salsa like you can't even imagine. That place is just, it's wonderful. And it's very well attended, even if it's cold and snowy outside in February or March. And they, and they continue to give away. So this is how we can multiply. And if everybody did one little thing, imagine. This can be highly consequential. But every university has the responsibility to nurture that. And that goes for higher administration. How many of us could have actually been big leaders, but we weren't encouraged? Right? Like just like counselors in high school that don't tell you and don't put your application forward, like the counselor that put my sisters in his drawer, there are many administrators that can see talent and don't cultivate it. So that's where we have to be like the students at Stanford and make our voices heard in powerful ways. And we can, and we can do better. So ingenuity, creativity, we know how to do it in this country. That's where all the inventions are coming from that everybody else is copying. So let's not give that up. And diversity is key for doing that. You can tell I don't care about this. And um, I am proposing a, com a comparative study on the same topic between two countries that are neighbors, the United States and Canada. And I'll give you a little bit of a background on why do I say this. I have been in the States and did my master's and PhD in urban education, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And I've been um, here six years. And it's almost six years that I've been uh, staying, working, and I'm a citizen of Canada now. And Canada, as you all know, uh, accepts 250,000 quarter of a million immigrants every year. I leave a step from a secondary school and I'm waiting at the bus stop looking at children from <laughs> many, many different ethnicities hanging around, <laughs> being together. And uh, again, the educational system, and I work for, I'm yeah. happy to work for Ryerson University, a very, very, very diverse right. university. What, so what's so the, question? The, the question is really, if we look at all these statistics mm -hmm. and compare the uh, United States and the Canada, and I'm not uh, a Canadian or uh, a United States um, uh, resident, I'm from Macedonia, mm -hmm. I'm thinking that there's a lot to learn from what Canada is doing. I totally country. agree. Not only Canada, but also Australia. So mm -hmm. the three, if we look at the four large Anglo speak, uh, English speaking immigrant receiving countries, Canada, Australia, United States, and, and the UK, Canada, it, in, in Australia, the immigrant population outperforms the native population in K through 12. In Canada, they close the gap between natives and foreign born children in one generation. And in the United States, the gap between the children of immigrants and the native-born children of native-born residents grows over time. So we are really good at manufacturing inequality. Just looking at the three comparative programs, what is wrong with this picture? And I will submit to you, it's we have very different integration policies. In Canada, they, and in Australia, they have an integration policy. They have an immigration policy and an integration policy. In the United States, we have an immigration policy that we can't figure out and that we continue to fight about, just like we do about ethnicity and diversity. And we do not have an integration policy. If you look at the number, the share of students enrolled in bilingual education programs, you'll see how many of them are native born who began in the K through 12 system. I am so happy that I was born before bilingual education programs were invented because I would have been put in that lower track. I would have been tracked because of my last name. I've looked at all the indicators they, because of my parents, we speak Spanish at home, because of a poverty, because my mother died when I was, all of the things were saying she's at risk. I was at risk. I was no such thing at risk. I was capable of learning if teachers were capable of teaching. Interesting. So that our phenomenon of at risk sometimes has become a double-edged sword. And that's something I think we need, to, we need to guard against. 
because otherwise it becomes self perpetuate And I know when I've said these things about uh, it for the for the, all the bilingual education industry, I almost got lynched once. But then I said, tell me if it's not the case that students who learn English are then kept there because you get there's a pernicious funding to keep them there, right? That pernicious funding is actually generating an, these inequities that are not produced in other countries that are getting as many immigrants as, as we're getting. And when I got to w uh, uh, New Jersey, when I tried to enroll my son in, in school, the teacher, the, 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 the bulldog at the elementary school said, um, so like for him, and oh, his first language is Spanish? I said, yes, that's all he spoke. Um, well, then he has to go, he was seven, he has to go be tested. And I said, no, he doesn't. She said, it's a state law. And I said to her, looked her in the eye, and I said, over my dead uh, body. And she said, okay, how many parents are willing to challenge the administrators who are going to track their kids and hold them back? Carlos had actually spent two years already at the lab school in, in a bilingual, you know, in a totally English uh, uh, nursery program and in kindergarten and first grade. So suddenly he was going to be demoted when we got to Princeton to put him in his little proper place. It's those kinds of invisible segregation patterns of sorting that we do on campus, look around, and we have to stop that. Everybody has to reach out to somebody else. And universities have it within their power to make sure that happens. And not to decide and not to take an active role is to be complicit. So. Yes. Thank you, Dean Clark. Um, as I'm thinking about implications for diversity and inclusion, I was wondering if you had a specific institutional type you had in mind. I'm thinking about the diversity of community colleges and for-profit colleges and how there's this emphasis on vocational training. So uh, are your implications similar or different, or is there a consideration of those institutionally? Um, I, I'm glad you brought that point up. So the aggregate statistics I showed were total enrollment. If we started breaking them out by collective open admissions and the like, you would see the kind of stratification and underrepresentation overall. I was trying to show you that the possibility is there based on the demographics. What we do and how we produce it and how we stratify that population is one of the biggest challenges that we face going forward. On the for-profit, I think it's, it's uh, criminal to see how young people are being are going into debt at a time of rising inequality for non-degree programs. And I, for one, am not complicit. When I was asked to serve on the board, I said, no, you can't pay me enough money to, par to participate in that crime. Um, but vocational education, and uh, uh, you know, when the labor market is, is moving the way it has been, there's, there's also the challenge of, of the PhD factory, that we're producing more PhDs than we can accommodate. So we're able to produce, and we have been producing a lot of uh, graduates in higher education despite these outcomes. And the question is, are we doing it strategically so that we can diversify the campuses in the, in the, leadership, in the leadership functions? So it, it is, it, in, um, what worries me is that many campuses, especially the open admission campuses, the diversity issue is not even on the table because they are already homogeneous. They're either all Latino or they're all predominantly uh, Latino or predominantly African American, and that is, is, is another issue. But that gets to the big class divide that we have, and the, the New York Times photograph that shows a big white limo, the tail end of a limo, uh, in front of the school bus dropping kids off at school, captures this as pointedly as anything does. So in the, a, as we continue to pull apart on the income scale, I think we have a formidable challenge to try to achieve the, the, the project of diversity. But make no mistake, our talent pool is incredible. And the arguments made in, in, uh, by uh, Paige in the difference show how the non-redundancy of skill, ideas, perspectives is so powerful producing creativity and innovation. So it's in our hands. The question is, are we going to take it? And or are we going to let it escape? And what's important, if you look at that photograph, at that, that slide, look at the size of the young people under five, five to nine, 10 to 14. They're shrinking because our fertility rate is dropping and it's also dropping for the minority groups, for the non-whites. So our population, you know, that, that ample supply is starting to shrink. And it's something we need. That's why it's a compelling 
state national interest that we pay attention to that thank you oh, Jen I'll let you have the last word Yeah, Jen, Jen is a survivor of, of my teaching at Princeton, so I have to tell you that. <laughs> uh, she now is a faculty member at NYU. Uh, you know what? I think the answer is, is already clear w based on what happened at NYU recently. So faculty can, if, if it's in their goal, it only takes one flea. I was taught by Janet Dickerson, whom you know. Janet Dickerson said, you know, it only takes one flea to make a big dog scratch. Well, one faculty member who joins with another faculty member who colludes with a third faculty member across those boundaries can add up to a substantial voice. So anyone who wants to reach out, and you know full well how hard it is trying to change the schools that are under-resourced and with bad leaders, et cetera, but it takes, a, it takes a leader, it takes one person to start the conversation and to mobilize it. If it is, an instru if it is a, a goal, schools of education have an incredible responsibility to do that. And if they don't take an initiative, then who's going to do it? It isn't going to be the, 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 the person reading uh, antiquities. I mean, that's all really important. But are they going to focus on who's not in the composition of their classes? No, because they're not looking at the achievement uh, 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 data on a daily basis. So anybody who sees this can actually begin to start just like you did when you had that website that nobody knew who did, who was behind it, where you challenged, you challenged the New York City establishment and had everybody's attention because you were challenging their numbers. It only took one flea to make the whole uh, uh, education system of New York City say, who is this person, right? So you know from personal experience that one person can begin to change a conversation someone who understands and who is committed to this mission. And I think we all have to do that. So if just one person gets one more, just one more, compound interest, compound interest. And so you can really make a chorus, even uh, by just poking away at it, just scratching away at it. And so faculty, without the faculty, universities don't exist. Leaders notwithstanding. Leaders notwithstanding, and especially at, at universities, where the faculty senate is the tail that's wagging the dog. So at those organizations, in those institutions, there is already an infrastructure to say, enough of this. What are we going to do to go beyond? Again, little steps, baby steps, but not to decide, it's to decide. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs>